Hey guys, I'm really excited to be up here talking about the newest feature to hit Nomad, and that is secret distribution, a very real and challenging problem, and how we leverage Vault in order to solve it. So before we begin, just a little background about myself. Uh, I'm a software engineer here at HashiCorp. I've been working on Nomad since before its initial 01 release, up until 05, which we've been talking about today. So it's been an exciting road. So what is secret distribution? Well, it turns out the applications we're running in our data centers require secrets. Be it database credentials, API tokens to talk to other services, TLS certificates to properly uh, do traffic, or S3 credentials to read data from your uh, S3 store and do large batch jobs that compute on them. So, Secret distribution is really about the problem of getting these secrets into your application. So the most naive way to solve this problem is you just write the secret in your application, right? Problem solved. Well, there's a lot of issues with this. One of the main ones is there's no single source of truth if you do this. Your, your secret is defined in that last example, it was a database secret. Well, your secret's defined both in the source code and it's defined in the database, which makes it incredibly hard to update in the case that you actually need to revoke access to the secret uh, because there was a compromise. Because now you have to recompile all your source, you have to send it to all the machines running it. It's a challenge, and when you have a compromise, any additional difficulty to roll that secret is really bad. And you, the other issue is you don't know who has access to it. Because what do we do with our source control? We check it in, and we usually don't put ACLs on who has access to what repo. So now your secret, everyone in the company can read it. So we can do something slightly better. We can make our applications take their secret configuration through a configuration file. And this leads to the next obvious question. How do you materialize this file? Well, it has our database credentials and we need to get it to the application before it starts. So we can use something like configuration management, uh, things like Chef and Puppet. And this is a huge improvement over the last thing we saw, because now all our secrets are defined in one place. You updated it in Chef, and now you can send it out across your cluster. But there's still problems with this. In the case that you do have a compromise and you need to roll your keys, well, these Configuration management tools are eventually consistent. So when I do change it and roll my key, update my database and start a roll, it might take 20 minutes before it hits all the nodes in the cluster. And that time, you're still compromised. So that's just one problem. The other is there's no access control. These tools are mainly designed to store configuration. And as such, they're not designed for the different uh, secrets they're storing if you try to shove credentials in them. And that shows itself in the fact that there's no auditing, so you don't know who's actually accessing the secrets. And when, you do come, when it comes time to revoke it, there's no built-in mechanism. So that's kind of the state of the world right now. We have secrets in many places, be it an online database like console, be it in configuration files, and checked into various places. We have limited visibility in who's accessing these secrets. And lastly, this is one of the bigger issues. There's no break glass procedure. When we are compromised, it's usually undefined on what the next steps are to take. So that's where Vault comes in. Vault's goal is to be a modern secret management tool and really rectify a lot of these issues we have. And it does it through a number of uh, features. And I'll briefly go over all of them because they're really important to understand how powerful Vault is and why we wanted to integrate it tightly with Nomad. So the first is secret storage. Vault has a very easy to use unified API to read and write secrets. So in this example, we see uh, we're writing, we're, oh sorry, let me go back. In this example, we see we're writing a secret into the namespace Geo API. And the API's token is named, we are writing a key called API token and the value secret. And it's also just as easy to read this value back out. So we issue a similar vault read against the Geo API, 
and we're returned our API token at the bottom. And we're also returned some other stuff, this lease ID and lease duration. And we'll talk about what this is in a moment because it's key to the revocation features of Vault. So the next thing that Vault does is dynamic secrets. This is kind of my favorite feature of Vault. The idea is that Vault integrates with a variety of applications like Postgres, Cassandra, Mongo. And what you do is you give Vault root, root access to these applications such that it can generate credentials on the fly. And so you never expose the root credentials to any end user. It's only ever exposed to Vault. And so then when a user wants access to, say, your Postgres database, it hits Vault, asks for credentials, and then Vault will reach out to Postgres on demand, create a new username and password, and send that to the uh, requesting client. And this is great because now we have an audit trail to find if there was a compromise, what was the application or the user who made that Vault request. And there's a number of backends that we can support. This is just a short list of the things we can do, and there's more, and it's only going to grow over time. So you can really see the power in this. Uh, so here's a quick example. We have Postgres. Uh, we're asking to read vaults from vault, a Postgres production credential, and you can see we've done two reads. Uh, the first read returned one username password, and the second returns a different. So now every uh, application using Postgres and accessing them through Vault is getting different credentials. And so that brings us to leases. We, I stated that every secret is returned with a lease. And the idea of a lease is it's binding to the lifetime in which that secret is valid. It's an API contract that Vault provides. And if the secret is not renewed, Vault will automatically revoke it. So in the case of that dynamic secret we saw, if the token isn't renewed and we have leaked it, well, once we hit our expiration date, Vault will reach out to Postgres and delete that username and password, meaning we don't have this infinite breach. Uh, and secrets can be revoked early by operators, so that defines this break glass procedure. So if we know we've been compromised, we can look in our audit logs, figure out what applications potentially had access and revoke all the secrets. So it really gives us a well-defined break glass procedure, which is really, really awesome. Next, it has rich ACL policies. So this lets you define who should have access to what. And by default, Vault uses a deny policy. So if you have a new user, they really don't have access to any secret unless you explicitly give them access. So this is really important. So for example, we have two users here. They both ask Vault, hey, give me some production Postgres credentials. And it might say yes to one user and deny the other user access. You might be asking, well, how does Vault know who should have access to what? So that's another feature of Vault. It has authentication. So the first step to interacting with Vault is to prove who you are. And you do that in a variety of ways. Uh, for These are just a few GitHub, LDAP, or TLS certificates. GitHub and LDAP are great for real human operators, and TLS certificates are great if you have machines interacting with Vault. And what happens once you authenticate, you're returned a token which maps to a set of permissions that you have. So for example, a user might send their GitHub OAuth token to Vault, and Vault will return a Vault token back. And this Vault token is just a random UUID. This UUID never exposes any information about what that token gives you access to. It's just a mapping that Vault can then use to see what permissions you have when you make subsequent requests. So that's kind of what Vault is. It solves the secret spell problem uh, because now we have a well-defined API. Uh, all of our secrets go into one place. And it protects also against external threats by using a sane crypto system. In transit, every secret is sent using TLS end-to-end. -end, and at rest, we store things using AES 256-bit encryption. So your secrets are always safe and encrypted. 
Uh, and it also protects against internal threats. If you have many, many users interacting with the same vault cluster, you want to segregate who has access to what, and we do that with ACLs. Uh, so that's Vault, and we're very excited to integrate it with Nomad. Uh, for the operations team, these are the wrong slides, so can we get the updated ones? This is going to end in about like two slides. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to wait because it doesn't make sense after this. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, is Kristen here or anyone from the HashiCorp team? Yeah, so I guess let's raise of hands who has used Nomad in the past. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so we're really excited about the new features coming in Nomad 05, and we hope you are too. We also want to say we always hear what your guys are asking for, and one of the bigger things is plugins. So happy to announce as well that after 05, that's the next set of work we're going to be tackling. So with 06, we're going to have all sorts of plugins, network plugins, uh, we'll have software, uh, we'll have volume plugins lifecycle plugins, and hopefully even driver plugins. So we really think after that, it'll really open up the use cases. Yeah? In 05, do we get the WAN RPC interface? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> can you repeat the question? Yeah, I can repeat the question. So he asked, will we able, be able to get a WAN advertise adder? Uh, so this kind of solves the problem of Internally, you want to use some addresses for your clients to communicate with servers, but when you're talking across different VPCs, the address might not be valid. Uh, the reason I said maybe is we have some ideas in which we might be able to simplify the networking quite drastically, and we, we don't want to put out a stopgap and rip it out in the very next release. So I think the patience will pay off. Uh, and there's a workaround, right? You just use the public IP. So. Yes, they definitely are. Uh, the question was, are ACLs on the roadmap? And ACLs are useful to uh, kind of lock down who can submit what. Uh, and yeah, they're on the roadmap. So we hope by, I don't, I want to stick to a timeline, but it's definitely not 10 releases down the road. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, we, the question was, uh, are we going to have rolling deploys that will then read console health checks so that you roll subsequent tasks only as you get uh, healthy nodes coming up? And the answer is yeah. Uh, I hope we can tackle that in 07. I have a question here. Question or a feature request? <laughs> <laughs> One second. In my room. It's not in her email. Yeah, let me just send the email again. Sorry, everyone. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Um, so I personally don't work on the Vault team, so the competitive analysis would be something more suited to ask them. But I think Vault is kind of uniquely positioned by introducing some novel ideas like these dynamic secrets. And with the dynamic secrets, you can introduce things like leases uh, and automatic revocation. So I think that's a very novel idea that I don't think anyone else has, has tackled. Um, so while there might be uh, key value stores that provide similar levels of data integrity and end-to-end -end encryption, really that's only the beginning of Vault. That might be the most naive and initial implementation, but 
as you use Vault more and more, the other features become exceedingly important. So I, I don't think there are any other applications that quite compete with Vault directly. I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Please keep me busy. <laughs> this might get awkward <laughs> real fast. <laughs> okay. Jack, did the new slides have like 70 slides instead of 20? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so, raise of hands, who thinks I'm a cat person or a dog person? Cats? Oh man, there's a lot of dog lovers here. I'm with that group. Cats all the way. <laughs> yeah. I have a really weird cat too. <laughs> I'm that guy. My cat has a flat face. So it's pretty much a useless animal other than looking cute. So, <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah, so what else is coming in 05? <laughs> So we always, we do our best to make sure we don't introduce any bugs, but they do happen, so there's obviously a lot of feature fixes coming in 05. We have a new team member, uh, he's actually in the crowd somewhere, so the people who follow Nomad closely might know it's been me and Diptanu doing most of the work. Uh, we have a new member, Michael, who started three weeks ago, so that's an exciting 05 edition. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we should put that in the change log. <laughs> okay, the comedy bit is over. <laughs> yeah, I apologize, guys. Uh, yeah. <sighs> okay, so that was Vault. What is Nomad? Uh, Nomad is a cluster scheduler, and for those of you who don't know what a cluster scheduler is, it, its main purpose is to take a set of user-submitted jobs and then to take that and shard it out onto a set of uh, workers. And so its main role is to keep the availability, handle the failure domains of nodes failing, data centers failing, and keeping your application in its SLO. So, there's a lot of cluster schedulers. You guys have probably heard of Kubernetes, Mesos, Swarm, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they all tackled the problem in slightly different ways. Uh, we had three simple goals when we built Nomad. We wanted it to be easy for developers. We wanted it to be operationally simple, so it's easy to deploy and maintain. And we wanted it to be built for scale. And what I mean by this last point is that we never wanted Nomad to be the part of your system architecture that's the bottleneck. It should always scale beyond your needs. So let's start with easy for developers. This is a Nomad job file. It's very easy to read and it's very easy to write, but it's incredibly powerful. And this, this simple job file is actually valid nomad job. So you could take this and run it and you'd get a Redis container somewhere on your cluster. So the key part about this is it declares what to run. Remember, we want developers to be interacting with nomad primarily and their interface is this job file. So they should just declare what to run and nomad should determine where and how to run it. We want to be able to abstract the work Away, the work away from the resources. So developers know their application best. They don't know what Amazon instance they should be provisioning, right? So we want to keep it abstracted. And it's powerful yet simple. If we just go back to this really, really basic job file, we see that there's a lot of interesting features to actually look at. You might notice that data centers is a list. Well, if you just add US West 1 to that list, the developer is saying, no man, my job can actually run in that data center as well. So if your data center fails, Nomad will actually migrate the job just by adding a simple string. And then you might see something like uh, driver equals Docker. Well, this might hint that there's more than one way to run your application. So Nomad has a variety of drivers. Drivers are what are responsible for actually running the task. 
And for containers, we have Docker and Rocket today. For virtual machines, we have K QEMU, uh, backed by KVM for acceleration. And if you have a standalone binary like a Java jar or just a normal binary, you can send that to Nomad too. So when we say it's easy for developers, not just in the abstract sense, it should be easy to run what you have today on Nomad. And if you're moving to a container world, great, we support that as well. And this list will only grow over time. So operationally simple. Well, Nomad runs in two modes. There's servers, which are responsible for managing the state of the cluster and make scheduling decisions, and clients are responsible for running those jobs through the variety of drivers we saw. And Nomad has a single binary. So one binary can operate both in server mode and client mode. And the best part is we don't have any external data store. So you deploy one binary Nomad. It manages itself using consensus among the servers. So all servers know the state of the whole cluster. And clients communicate back to RPC to figure out what to run. Lastly, it's built for scale. So when we set out to build Nomad, we have happened to build a few distributed systems before. So we took learnings from Surf and Console. Surf, we took its uh, gossip protocol, so now servers can automatically discover each other, even across regions. So your US servers can discover the Europe servers using gossip. And we took the RAF consensus algorithm from Console, which has been proven at very, very large scales of tens of thousands of nodes. So we really looked back to what we have done. We also looked forward. So we wanted to look at the state of the art in both academia and industry. And to do that, we looked at various groups like AmpLab, who have made things like Spark and Mesos. And we also looked at Google's research into uh, schedulers. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Google runs Borg for their production scheduler. And when they ran into performance issues, they spun up a new scheduler research team, which produced the Omega paper. They came up with a new design for schedulers called uh, shared state optimistic schedulers. And in the open source, Nomad is the only one that so happens to be a shared state optimistic scheduler. And we think it paid off. Uh, just six months ago, we did a benchmark called the Million Container Challenge. And we ran a million containers across 5,000 hosts and made all the scheduling decisions in five minutes. The slide would have been cool had Citadel not just did 40 million containers, but I'll take it. So that's what Nomad and Vault are, and I'm very excited to bring them together today. So you might be thinking, well, Vault seems to solve the whole secret distribution problem. So just shove a Vault token in the job and you're done. Well, you could do that with Vault with Nomad. Nomad supports environments, so you, environment variables. So we could just put the vault token inside the job, run it, and we're done. Well, there's still a lot of problems with this. It's really kind of the same set of issues with configuration management. It's You check your Nomad job into version control, so now everyone has access to that vault token, and it's stored in plain text. And really, the main issue is, how does that token get renewed, right? We talked about the fact that Vault will automatically revoke tokens so that you don't have one token that gives you infinite access into your, all the secrets of your cluster. So if you just stored it in version control and you ran it a week later, well, you'd be sending some random UUID that Vault's like, I don't know what this is. So I think we'll agree that some sort of integration is necessary. So when we set out to integrate the two, we had a set of goals. The goals were the job should have access to only the policies they need. We also want to assert that job submitters have access to the policies they ask for. So you would never want your marketing guy to ask for Nomad to run a job with database access to your credit card database. That doesn't make sense. So we wanted to be able to assert that. Last, next, we wanted it to be easy to use. If it's super complicated and esoteric, nobody's going to use it. And lastly, we wanted it to be low trust. And I want to cover what I mean by that. So there's this idea of a chain of trust in security. 
Uh, you start with something you trust, like your operator, and you end with something you also trust, like your binary. Right? If you didn't trust your operator, you wouldn't give them access to those vault policies in the first place. And if you didn't trust your binary not to expose your secrets, you would never give them the secrets. So you have these two ends to the chain that you trust, but every part of the system that touches your secret subsequently is a potential vulnerability. Uh, it's a point of compromise, really. So when we built this system, we wanted to endow as little trust to Nomad as possible. And as I go through the implementation, we'll see how we did that. So I want to start with easy to use. On the server side, all you need to do to enable Vault integration is add this to your config. You say, please enable Vault. Here's the address to go talk to it. And here's your Vault token. This Vault token needs access to the policies that your job submitters will have. And we'll talk about how it's used later. And you might notice the address is HTTP, not S. It also can be S, but for the purpose of this example, I don't want TLS certificate paths in it. So trust me, it's secure. Uh, while we're taking breaks, I could add it, <laughs> apparently. Um, so on the job submitter side, the thing the developers are interacting with, all you have to do is enumerate the policies you need access to, and that's it. Next, it's the normal workflow. You do a Nomad run of your job that has the list of policies. And Nomad, the CLI tool, will automatically find your Vault token in the environment and send that as well to Nomad servers. So the first thing to give in our chain of trust is the network. The Nomad run tool works by sending the job file and the token over the network to an HTTP endpoint. So the way we rectified this is with Nomad 05, we'll be introducing cluster-wide TLS. So all communication to the server's HTTP endpoints will be encrypted, so you don't have to worry about any intercept leaking your vault token. And we'll encrypt traffic between clients and servers, servers and servers, and all HTTP endpoints. So the first thing to give. So the next claim was we wanted to ensure that you had access to the vault policies you've defined in your job file. So the user submits a vault token and the job to Nomad. If you remember, the job has the enumerated list of policies. Well, what Nomad does next is it reaches out to vault, sends the user's vault token, and what vault returns back is the set of policies that user has access to. Then we can do something incredibly simple. If the set of policies they ask for in Vault returns a similar set or a, and that job has a subset of those policies, we allow access. If the user asks for policy baz bam and Vault says they only have access to foobar, we deny that job submit request and we return an error to the client. So next we do something quite novel. The user submitted the Vault token that gives them access to all these policies in their job file. But what, does, what the server does as soon as it verifies that they did have access is we, disregard, we discard that token. So at no point does Nomad have that memory, that token stored in a long-term persisted fashion. And how do we do this? Well, Vault has a very nice feature called child tokens. If you have a Vault token that has access to a set of policies, you can ask a Vault to derive you a child token that has a subset of these policies. So if you remember in that configuration of Vault, of Nomad, we give it a Vault token. That Vault token has access to these sets of policies the job submitters will have, and it can then create a child token that is just the subset that that job it requires. So it's minimal access to your secrets. And you might be thinking there's still risk with this, right? That vault token might have access to a lot. But we think it's a lot better to give it to a handful of servers, three or five, than distributing your secret material across thousands of clients. And we can do better than just saying, oh, that's not good. The servers, we can mitigate the risk even further. The servers aren't running user submitted work. And the, there's a very small range of ports that have to be accessible on that 
uh, server node. So we can use firewalls to restrict it even further. So we believe we still are meeting our goal of low trust. You're trusting a few servers, and you can lock it down very easily. So where are we at? The server has the job file, excuse me, and it runs its scheduler, and based on criteria of the job, it'll pick a client to run that job. So we send it over to the client. We send it over to the client, and now the client inspects the job file, and it detects that it needs a vault token. So what it does is it makes a RPC call to the Nomad server saying, please derive a vault token for this task, and here's my node secret ID. Well, what is this node secret ID? It's a new concept we're introducing with Nomad 05, and it's a means to mitigate client spoofing. So we have TLS across our cluster, which gives us encryption and some level of identity, but there's still a possibility, there's still an attack vector where one node pretends to be another. And it says, I'm running this task that has that juicy vault token I really want access to. And so what it could do is it could talk to the Nomad server and be like, I'm that client, please give it to me. So we want to prevent that because it's a big attack vector. So what we do is we generate a secret ID that when the client registers with Nomad for the first time, it generates a random secret ID and it sends it to the servers. The servers then will store that and any subsequent request for information about that node will never return its secret ID. So in the end, we have this piece of information that only the node knows about and the servers. So if we ever have a client trying to spoof, we can ask for its secret ID and we can match. So if it doesn't match, we know it's a bad client. So we won't send any vault tokens to it. Next, we do something. This was probably the most complicated part of the talk, so bear with me. We send our token to vault, and we make a child token that has the subset of policies that user asked for. But we don't just use we don't just create the token. What we do is we create the token and put it in a cubby hole. And what we're returned is a wrap token, which lets you access that cubby and read the actual token. And we're also returned an accessor. This accessor is a reference to a vault token. The reference gives you the ability to revoke that token, but it doesn't give you the ability to derive secrets using it. So the client gets the wrap token, it sends it to Vault, and Vault returns back its final token. So what we accomplished is the client has its token, and the server has the token accessor. And beyond that, we accomplished a few more things. If we wouldn't go through all that complicated mess unless we accomplished some very desirable goals. So with the node ID, we made it so the client cannot be spoofed. There's an asterisk there because if you somehow manage to break out of your VM or your Docker container and then do a root escalation exploit, then you might be able to spoof that one node. But that's a lot of ifs, right? So now the client has the required token and it's renewing it. And this is key because now applications that are using that Vault token don't have to be bothered with the renew semantics of Vault. They just get a token that's valid as long as they're valid. And the server has never seen the token. And this was a huge uh, goal for us because if every token got funneled through the server and the server had access to all of them, it would be a prime target to hit so you could get access to secrets in your cluster. And then lastly, it has an accessor that can be used to revoke. So we're almost at the end of the chain. And the last step is kind of to expose this vault token to the end application. So we could just write it to disk and then give the path to the app, but we do something slightly better. We write it to a tempfs, and for those of you not familiar with, with a tempfs, it's an in-memory file system that so any write you do will actually end up being stored in RAM and not onto the block device. And if the machine's boot, rebooted, that data disappears. So you don't have to worry about the the node it's running on dying, coming back up, and your secrets are exposed. 
and it lets us mount them into all drivers. So your secret is accessible both in your Java app and your Docker app and even your VMs. And there's an opt-in environment variable. A lot of applications assume that there's a vault token in its environment. So we let you do that. Simply annotating your vault block with env equals true, which is the default, will inject a vault token into your environment. So we went through all that effort. What does it look like? Well, if we use the nomad fs command, which shows you the file system from the point of view of your end application, we see a couple folders. We see a local directory, a temp directory, and the secret stir. This secret stir is, if you remember, backed by a tempfs, but from the point of the view of the application, they can write to it like any other folder. If we open up that folder, we see a vault token file. And if we try to read that vault token, we get permission denied. That's kind of weird. Why did we do this? Well, the secrets directory is a location for your application to write sensitive material. So it would be quite bad if anyone who has access to Nomad could then go introspect that sensitive material. So we make the secret store list only. And then lastly is token revocation. So the Vault server has that token accessor. And how do we use it? Well, when a node dies or the allocation completes, the task successfully ran, used its Vault secret, got its database credentials, and then exits gracefully, well, we revoke that token. And what that does is it binds the token lifecycle to that of the allocation. So we don't, this is the other element of that chain of trust. We don't trust that that vault token didn't somehow get leaked. Maybe you mistakenly logged it into your logs and then it went to Splunk and someone could then use it. So instead, as soon as the allocation finishes and could no longer be using that vault token, we revoke it and any secret generated by vault is immediately unaccessible. So we set out with these goals, and I think we hit all of them. Uh, but I think we want to do one better. Let's make it even easier. So how did we do that? We did it in two ways. When we did Nomad Run previously, it required that you provide a vault token that proves you have access. Well, if you're running in an organization where you trust all your internal users, then this is an extra step that is somewhat irrelevant, and it just creates a makes a harder step to get access to your secrets. So this is still protected in some way because you only have access to the policies Nomad has access to. So you can still limit the scope of secrets. The next thing we did is we first classed console templates. And for those of you who haven't used console template, it's a very powerful templating tool that can access data out of console and vault. So here's what it looks like. We can annotate our task with a template block. And this template, we can read it, says, please access vault and read from my Postgres prod credentials, and then write out a file that has my username and my password. And please write it to the secrets directory so it stays in memory. And if we then look at it, well, we can look in our secrets store, and we have the database credentials. We can't read it over the network, but what does the application see? They just see the username and password, and they can read it as any other config. And this runs before the application starts, so it makes it incredibly easy to distribute secrets securely with all the benefits of Vault, audit logs, revocation, ACL policies, and in the end, you don't even have to change your app. It just reads a config file. So we're super proud of that. Uh, but it really doesn't stop here. Now that we have a vault token for the task, we can build a future with less trust built in inherently. And what do I mean by that? Well, now that we have this vault token, which has securely identified what tasks we are, we can do a lot of things. So for example, we can download artifacts into the task, but don't trust that they're have integrity. Instead, we can do it HMAC using our vault token and hitting vault's transit backend and verify what we're downloading is both has integrity and hasn't been tampered with over the network. Also, it allows us to do things like service-to-service -service authentication. We can 
dynamically generate TLS certificates that identify our app and securely talk from one service to the other using TLS certificates. And lastly, we can pass them into the plugins that we'll be bringing in Nomad 06. So this will enable your plugins to interact securely with other systems. And one example of this that I hope someone builds, because it would be really cool, is we could have a volume plugin that materializes a folder onto the disk where whatever you write into it is encrypted. So you get on-disk encryption for persisted data. So I think there's a lot of future possibilities if we, uh, as people adopt Vault and Nomad and build tooling around it. So I hope that got you somewhat excited about the Nomad Vault integration. Thank you. That's the talk. <laughs>